Hi class, this is Juan Ramirez with EE2715. Today we're going to talk about the sort of relationship um, or connection or similarities in transient behavior of mechanical systems um, as compared to uh, the transient behavior of electrical systems. So after chapter 7, which is what we're covering now, we'll get into chapter 8 on second order circuits. Um, and, and those circuits are uh, characterized by uh, second order differential equation. Similarly though, there are mechanical systems that are also characterized in a similar way by second order differential equations, such as a mass uh, spring system. Um, but with regards to first order circuits, one uh, type a mechanical system that exhibits similar type of uh, first order transient behavior is uh, that of a thermal system. And so uh, you can see here that we are um, going to really just focus on uh, thermal systems and we're going to mainly touch on the fact that thermal systems exhibit time constants um, the way an RC or an RL circuit do. Uh, do. Um, so we'll, we'll start off by highlighting um, heat transfer by conduction, which means uh, how you transfer heat, which is thermal energy, um, through items that are making uh, physical contact. So that's what conduction refers to. So um, the, the heat transfer is the flow of energy, so it's power in watts. Um, so, oops. In watts and um, it's equal to lambda which is uh, thermal conductivity of the material um, and so lambda is in watts per meter time degree C um, and, and it's related to um, you know, inherent to rather the actual material being used. So for example, a piece of aluminum is going to have a pretty high thermal conductivity. It's going to conduct heat well, uh, whereas a piece of two by four plywood is going to have a low thermal conductivity, does not transfer heat well. All right, and then we have A, which is cross-sectional area. Uh, in meters squared. Um, delta T is temperature difference, so T2 minus T1. Um, and of course that's in degree C. And finally, uh, D is length or distance. in meters. So if you think of uh, heat being conducted through, let's say, a rectangular bar, sometimes we call these bus bars when we're using it to transfer electricity, um, and you're going to also be transferring heat because everything has resistance, electrical resistance, and therefore dissipates some heat. So if you transfer heat through this bar, this bar will have a cross-sectional area A. It'll have a length D. It'll have a thermal conductivity, lambda. And it'll have a temperature difference across it. So at one side, you'll have temperature T1. At the other side, you'll have temperature T2. So now let's move to thermal resistance. So thermal resistance is um, essentially the inverse of heat transfer times the rate of, uh, not the rate of change, the uh, temperature difference. 
in that material and it's in uh, degree C per watt so make sure you, um, you know, have a have a good understanding of what we mean when we say thermal resistance again every material will have thermal resistance just like it'll have thermal conductance because of its thermal conductivity so the conductivity is um, due to the actual material the conductance also takes into account the thermal conductivity and the geometry of the material and the thermal resistance is uh, proportional to the inverse of that high thermal conductance low thermal resistance and vice versa okay so now that we've spoken about heat transfer and thermal resistance let's talk about heat flow in electrical systems so here we have um, on the left a transistor which is an active electronic component as opposed to passive electrical component like resistors, capacitors, inductors. Uh, so transistors you will touch on in your uh, subsequent electronics classes, but for now we're just really going to talk about the um, thermal aspects. Um, so the transistor has what we call a junction, which is where the actual transistor behavior, electrical behavior, is happening. I um, mean, at the junction, it'll have a junction temperature. And to the right, I'm kind of modeling thermally, so sort of more like a thermal diagram, um, this same uh, setup. Okay, so, so the transistor has a junction. Um, then you have this transistor inside of a package and the outside of the package is connected to um, a metal case. So let's change the color. So this is what we call the case. And it has a case temperature. All right. Now... Uh, behind the case, and usually the case has a small hole to um, put a bolt through and then a nut on the other side to mount it to something. In this case, it's mount mounted to a heat sink, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but before the heat sink, we see that there's a small, um, or, or rather a thin, thermal pad. The thermal pad has a, a different temperature as well. The thermal pad we use for a couple reasons. One is that um, there's um, small imperfections in the flatness of the case of the transistor and the flatness of the heat sink that we use to dissipate heat. Um, and due to those imperfections, the contact is not uniform throughout the case and heat sink. And so you develop very small uh, voids or air pockets. And those air pockets hurt the thermal transfer or the heat transfer. It increases the thermal resistance. Um, so that's not good. Uh, and so one way to remedy that is to have uh, a thermal pad or thermal grease to try to fill in those small um, gaps or holes. The second reason is that sometimes the case has an electrical potential that is not zero, it's not ground. Whereas we usually want our heat sinks to be connected to electrical ground, such that if somebody touches the heat sink, it might be hot, but it's not electrically live or energized. There isn't, you know, let's say 100 or 200 volts between that heat sink and physical earth ground that might shock you. Um, so we also use it for insulation. So that thermal pad is a good thermal conductor, but a poor uh, electrical conductor. It's a good electrical insulator. Okay, so then we speak of the heat sink. Uh, 
and that has a temperature TS for heat sink. And the heat sink we use to better dissipate the heat um, that is being produced by the device uh, through its electrical behaviors. Um, and finally, let's use yellow for uh, the ambient. And the ambient is just the local environment around that electrical component or electrical system. Um, and ambient temperature, TA, tends to be anywhere between 25 degrees C, as usually the number, but sometimes um, it could be 30 degrees C, it could be 20 degrees C, uh, just depends on how you define it. Um, you know, usually when you're doing a design, you're uh, assuming worst case condition. Uh, so you, you figure out what your worst case ambient temperature is. For example, if we're designing a circuit that'll be inside an MRI machine in some hospital in, you know, uh, maybe the desert in Phoenix, Arizona, um, and perhaps a hospital that doesn't have good air conditioning or something like that, um, then you would have a higher ambient temperature. Um, and if you were operating in, you know, maybe Canada and it was very cold and there wasn't proper heating in like a hospital for that MRI machine, maybe you'd have a pretty low ambient temperature. So we would take those factors into account. So for this um, situation where you have a transistor, which has its case connected through a thermal pad mechanically to a heat sink, um, and the heat sink obviously makes uh, sort of contact, uh, if you will, or, or is in the presence of the local environment and the ambient temperature around it. You end up with what we call an equivalent thermal circuit. Um, and that looks like what we have here below. So um, I'll kind of highlight with the same colors each thing, right? So let's start from right to left. So first thing we have is ambient temperature. Okay. Um, and again, that's usually fixed. It's usually 25 degrees C, maybe a little bit lower, maybe a little higher. Um, but due to this electrical component heating up, the ambient temperature is not going to have any significant change. So even if we're heating up this component a bunch, ambient temperature will still be 25 degrees C um, because it, the, the mass, the heat capacity of the air in the environment that that component is in is so high that uh, the amount of change in temperature is negligible. All right. Um, then we have the heat sink. Um, and notice that there is a thermal resistance between the heat sink and the ambient temperature. So uh, you could kind of think of that as some thermal resistance between um, heat sink and ambient. Then we have the case. Uh, and we're, I'm going to skip the pad, thermal pad, for uh, just simplicity. So case, so think of from the case, there's some thermal resistance between the case and the heat sink. Again, neglecting the thermal pad. And finally, there's the junction, so sort of the internals of the device. And we did that with green. All right, so you have some thermal resistance between the junction and the case. So notice that we drew what looks like an electrical circuit. Well, it turns out that there are circuit analogies between electrical circuits and thermal systems. And we can model a thermal system using sort of a, a similar type of electrical circuit with quantities that are represented a little bit differently. So the analogies go as follow. Um, in an electrical circuit, uh, 
a current source would be defined as thermal heat transfer in a thermal system. In uh, an electrical circuit, a voltage or a voltage source would be defined in a thermal system as temperature. Um, electrical resistance would be defined as thermal resistance uh, in a thermal system. And electrical capacitance would be defined as heat capacity or thermal mass in a thermal system. Um, and so that's why you see in the equivalent thermal circuit above that there's a current source symbol on the left, but it has PV for dissipated power at the junction. And then you see a plus and minus representing sort of a voltage, but it actually, um, in this case, symbolizes in the thermal circuit the temperature at that node or that point um, to ground. And then you have a thermal resistance, and after the thermal resistance, you have a different temperature. Like in a circuit, you would have a different voltage because you have some voltage drop. Um, in the same way, you have a temperature difference, and, and therefore the temperature at the case will be different than the temperature at the junction, uh, and so on. So let's do a quick example. Um, and maybe I'll use a different color for our example here. I'll call this example one. Um, let's say our ambient temperature was 30 degrees C. And let's say power dissipated was one watt of power. And let's define, let's set some thermal resistance values. So let's say between the heat sink and ambient, um, the thermal resistance might be, I don't know, five. Um, and again, thermal resistance is in degrees C per watt. Maybe the thermal resistance between the case and the heat sink might be a little higher, might be 10 degrees C per watt. And maybe from junction to case, it might be 20 degrees C per watt. Um, so then you would analyze this the way you would analyze an electrical circuit, right? Um, where you see that sort of open circuit between, uh, you know, where, where the junction temperature is and the case temperature, um, just think of that as a voltage across an open circuit. Um, and when you think about it that way, which is what it's representing, you have a current source, if it were an electrical circuit. In the case of a thermal circuit, it's power. And that's flowing through these resistors. Um, and at the very end, you can represent this as a voltage source. And that voltage source is modeling the ambient temperature. So it has a value of 30 degrees C. Okay, so let's look at what the temperature drop would be due to the power dissipated flowing through the thermal resistances. Um, okay, so let me use a, a different color for this, maybe a darker purple. purple. Um, so you have one watt of power flowing through the first one, let's say the junction to case. Um, and we're going to use the same Ohm's law to analyze this thermal circuit. So the power, which in a circuit would represent, in an electrical circuit would represent current, times the resistance would give you, in an electrical circuit, a voltage, in a thermal circuit, a temperature difference. So temperature difference would be the resistance, 20 degrees C per watt, times the power, uh, one watt. So it would be 20 degrees C. 20 degrees C per watt times one watt is 20 degrees C. Um, all right, so we'll do the other ones a little quicker. 10 degrees C per watt times one watt is 10 degrees C. That's a temperature difference between the two points. Um, and then for the last one, you get five degrees C uh, between the heat sink and the ambient. So if we know that at this point, you have 30 degrees C. Then this point over here between, um, or, or at the heat sink, 
would be 30 degrees C plus 5 degrees C drop. So it would be 35 degrees C. All right, so 30 degrees C from the very right, the ambient temperature, plus a 5 degrees C uh, difference between the heat sink and ambient. Um, so heat sink is at 35 degrees C. Between the case and the heat sink, there's a 10 degrees C difference. And therefore, the other side must be 45 degrees C. And there's a 20 degrees C difference between the junction and the case. So 45 plus 20 is 65 degrees C. So TJ is equal to 65 degrees C. And that's how we are able to use um, the generalized thermal circuit um, and used electrical circuit analysis techniques to find different values within the thermal system. Okay, um, heat capacity. Heat capacity, or otherwise known as thermal mass, refers to um, how much heat some material and its geometry can hold, and it is equal to the rate of change of heat or thermal energy uh, with respect to a change in temperature. So notice the denominator is dt, capital T though, so capital T represents temperature, and heat capacity is in joules per degree C. So um, everything also has heat capacity, just like it has thermal resistance. Um, transient heat flow in electrical systems is the next thing we'll cover here. And now let's take a look at this guy here. No longer do we have the heat sink. All we have is a junction, a case, and ambient. So we're going to kind of simplify it a little bit. Um, and so before each thermal resistance, we're going to also now include um, the heat capacity at the junction. So probably going to be really low because the junction of that transistor is very small. So small heat capacity can't hold a lot of heat. Uh, the case, case has definitely much larger heat capacity than the junction. And then ambient we don't even model the capacitance because it's infinitely large, right? The ambient temperature has a lot of heat capacity. It takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of the ambient temperature. Uh, okay, so um, we can now kind of move on to an example to really kind of show how all these things come to play. Um, so let's take a look at example one. Uh, I'll kind of leave uh, some of these items below for after. So let's say you want to find the thermal time constant of a power resistor junction and a function for temperature. And what's given? Uh, we're given that the ambient temperature is 30 degrees C. We're given that through this power resistor, um, we're putting 5 volts across it and one amp through it so that that tells you by ohm's law that that resistor must have a resistance of five ohms but it also tells you that the dissipated power will be five volts times one amp which is five watts and from the data sheet we were able to find the thermal resistance to be 10 degrees c per watt between the junction and the ambient and we found that the heat capacity is 10 joules per degree C. Um, and that's how much heat um, that power resistor could hold. So the question is, how can we find a thermal time constant of the resistor junction and the function for temperature? So the answer is, let's analyze this as a RC transient circuit. Um, and the reason we could do that is because, again, our thermal resistance is analogous to electrical resistance, and our heat capacity is analogous to um, electrical capacitance. And when you have an RC circuit, uh, you can model it with, um, you know, a, a first-order 
system and follow the step-by-step -step method that we learned in chapter seven. So that's what we're gonna do here. And sort of the neat aspect is, well, one, um, we'll find that we can use the same exact steps to analyze a thermal system. And two, we also see that um, there are a lot of similarities between the way uh, the ways electrical, mechanical, thermal, fluidic systems behave. All right, so let's look at the circuit below. Um, we use a switch to show that at time zero, you start to apply five watts of power. So before time zero, no power was applied to the resistor. Um, it was just kind of hanging out uh, in the lab or whatever. And then at time zero, you close the switch, meaning you applied your five watts of power. And um, we're representing the heat capacity of the power resistor, 10 joules per degree C. And then again, there's a thermal resistance between uh, the junction, so the junction's right over here, and ambient. And that thermal resistance between those two points is 10 degrees C per watt. And the temperature at ambient is 30 degrees C. And so now we can go ahead and actually do our step-by-step -step method. So the first step is to, at the initial state, find the initial temperature. So where for an RC circuit, you would first look for initial capacitor voltage. Um, for a thermal circuit, the analogy between, um, or the, really, the quantity analogous for a electrical voltage is a thermal temperature. So we're gonna look for the initial junction temperature. And to do this, you're gonna look at before the switch has closed, therefore the five watt source is no longer in the picture. And you're assuming steady state, meaning you're looking at the initial condition a long time before the transient, assuming it was hanging out in the lab all day. Um, and therefore the junction temperature was the same as the ambient temperature. You replace that heat capacity with an open and look for um, the temperature by uh, analyzing it as if it were a voltage. Um, you get 30 degrees C because there's no uh, flow of energy through that thermal resistance and therefore there's no temperature drop across it. Okay, how about the next step, final state? So for the final state, now the switch has been closed and therefore the 5 watt source is now present. Uh, but you again replace the heat capacity with an open circuit. And now that temperature, which um, in an electrical circuit would be a capacitor voltage, um, is what we call the final temperature at the junction. And now we do some very simple circuit analysis. We know that the temperature, the ambient temperature is 30 degrees C represented with a voltage source. So it'll have that temperature that won't change. Um, and then the five watt power source represents a current source and all that current will flow through the 10 degrees C per watt thermal resistance. So notice I'm going back and forth between thermal and electrical circuit analogies because we all are more familiar with the electrical circuit um, analysis since we're a couple of courses into um, that, that knowledge. So you have five watts through the 10 degrees C per watt thermal resistance. So therefore, uh, if we look on the left, the difference in temperature between those two points will be 50 degrees C, five watt times 10 degrees C per watt. And that means that the temperature at the junction will be the ambient temperature plus that difference. So 30 degrees C is the temperature at uh, the ambient temperature and 50 degrees C is the temperature difference, giving us 80 degrees C final junction temperature. So now we're gonna look at the thermal resistance, um, but specifically the Thevenin thermal resistance after the switch is closed. Um, after the switch is closed, you turn off your sources to analyze the equivalent resistance. So that means you uh, replace the power source with an open circuit because that behaves like a current source and you replace the temperature source with um, in a short circuit because it re you know represents a, a voltage source 
what you have left is just the thermal resistance of 10 degrees C per watt. So that's what you end up with here. Now you can find the thermal time constant using the same RC therm, uh, time constant equation. So the Thevenin thermal resistance times the heat capacity uh, would give us 100 seconds when you multiply those two values. 100 seconds, that sounds like a pretty long time, um, but it actually comes to show that temperature changes usually happen a lot slower. So, um, you know, where you could design an electrical RC circuit to have a time constant of a few microseconds or maybe milliseconds, maybe even seconds, usually thermal time constants are um, in, you know, hundreds of seconds, minutes, sometimes 10, 20, 30 minutes to give you um, sort of a, a, an idea of uh, some of the uh, equipment that I work with. I work on MRI machines, as you all know, and um, the gradient coil, which we use to create a three-dimensional gradient field and spatially encode the RF signals used to image your body. Um, that gradient coil takes 30 minutes to an hour um, to reach a steady state temperature. So, you know, the time constant is up in that area of 30 minutes. So it's a really long thermal time constant, and it just tells you that temperatures don't change that fast. Um, and that's due to the physics of it. And we get to analyze it with what we're learning here, which is pretty cool. So now we can take everything that we've uh, just uh, calculated and plug it into that general capacitor voltage equation for RC circuits, except instead of being a capacitor voltage, it's a junction temperature. Again, because in an electrical circuit, a voltage is analogous to a temperature in a thermal circuit. So you plug in your final temperature, 80 degrees C plus your initial temperature minus your final temperature times E to the negative T over the thermal time constant tau. That's in degree C for time greater than or equal to zero. Um, and then you could simplify it and get um, this equation down here. Pretty cool, right? It just You can plot out uh, in time what the temperature is going to look like at the junction. And you could also see that it exhibits um, transient first order behavior, uh, which is very similar to that of electrical RC and RL circuits. So that's really the point of this is um, now you have sort of in your toolbox an analysis method for uh, thermal systems as well, which you will invariably be um, you know, exposed to if you choose to get into uh, electrical system design or even other types of mechanical system design. Um, there's always going to be um, a, a thermal component to it, and being able to analyze some of those uh, aspects uh, can be pretty important. So uh, we'll actually go ahead and take this knowledge into Lab 2, which is what we will be um, working on the first week of the new year. And uh, yeah, hopefully you found this interesting and please feel free to reach out if you have questions.